a pastor, it's beautiful, first beautiful morning of the year. It's a Sunday, it's like like April, and it's beautiful and warm and sunny, and the grass is starting to grow, and it's awesome. And uh, he's, he's an avid golfer, and it's so beautiful, he wants to go play golf, but he's got to preach that morning. So he, he calls his, um, his staff pastor and says, <coughs> I'm sick today. <coughs> Could you cover <coughs> for me? And the staff pastor says, sure, all right, I'll cover for you. He says, all right, thanks. <coughs> Bye, he hangs up. And he grabs his golf clubs and runs to the golf course. So he's out on the golf course playing, and he, he is playing the round of his life. I mean, it is low score everywhere. And, and uh, St. Peter saying, Jesus, what are you doing? Why are you letting him get by with this? He's supposed to be at church. He said, just watch this one. So the guy steps up. It's a par four. It's a short par four. And and the pastor just drives a ball, and it is the best drive he's ever had. It goes straight, hits right in front of the green, rolls up onto the green, and rolls right in the cup. And the pastor watches. He's like, yes, yes. And St. Peter looks over at Jesus and said, I thought you said you were going to get him. That's a double, that's a double eagle. Come on, that's a double eagle. Nobody ever does that. He says, that's right. Who's he going to tell? <laughs> Things in life are meant to be celebrated with people. Without people, there's not a lot of joy in this life. Now, some of your greatest challenges are people, but think about it. Your greatest rewards are the people that you're with. The things you enjoy most are the people that make your life joyable. And if you want your life to be bad, just have relational problems with the people you're closest to. If you want your life to be good, let there be no relational problems with the people you're closest to. Have you ever felt alone? You ever felt like maybe you got no people? I was... um, I was a freshman. All right, I got saved right before I went to Bible college. I was uh, 17 years old when I got saved. I was not a nice guy. And I got recently, I'll tell you what, I was in a, I was in a class filled with a bunch of people. And uh, I had just given my heart to Christ and got called into ministry. And the group of us were sitting around all of my senior class. There were 34 of us, so I knew them all, and they all knew me. And we were sitting in a class, and we were talking about what we were going to do after we graduate so they could print it up in our graduation announcement. And they said, Kevin, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm going to be a pastor. And the room erupted in laughter. I don't know why. Anyway, the room erupted in laughter, and, and everybody was laughing about that. But anyway... So I go off to Bible college, and I'm still 17, yes, 17-year-old college freshman. It's a little too young to be a college freshman. Uh, Yeah, so I was not emotionally prepared for what happened. I get there within a month. I'm on disciplinary probation. We don't talk about that. But I am on probation, Uh, one of the most strict probations they've ever given. A year and a half I was on. It was bad. Well, I hung out with a group of guys that we were all on disciplinary probation, all of us. Every single person in my friend group either got kicked out of college or was on disciplinary probation. It was CBC, though. I mean, you could sneeze and get on probation. Those of you that don't know what legalistic Christianity looks like, you should have went to college with me. All right. Blue jeans were illegal in class, so we all wore black jeans to get around the rules because it said blue jeans in the handbook. Yeah, yeah. Legalism doesn't work. Anyway, so here I was. I was in trouble. All my friends were in trouble. And I go out. I make it through that year. And I go back. And I'm working in a factory. I had a 2.2 GPA my freshman year. I'm on disciplinary probation. I come back home. I work in a factory. And I'm working there. And I'm working next to a guy that claims to be a Pentecostal youth pastor. And this guy, he is far from a moral person. I mean, far, far from it. Um, it. It was bad. It was really bad. As a matter of fact, it was so bad that he was giving Jesus a bad name, saying he was a Christian and the way he would behave and act on, in the assembly line. I was working at a factory and it, it was bad. As a matter of fact, one day um, I'm judging him because he did something really stupid and said something about a girl and talked about what he was going to do that night. And then he started telling somebody how much Jesus loved them. And I remember looking in my refrigerator as I'm doing it and thinking, that guy's nothing but a hypocrite and he's a faker and a fraud. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you're just like him. Oh, that was tough. So you know what I decided to do? 
I decided that I would buy it. I would sell out to this Christian message, all in. No excuses, no complaints. The person I was, I'm not going to be anymore. Well, I made that change and I went back to Bible college and none of my friends wanted to hang out with me anymore. <laughs> it's true. They didn't want to hang out with me. I had no friends because the people I used to hang out with and I, we didn't do the same things anymore. So I couldn't be with them and they couldn't be with me. So I had no friends. And by the way, all the Christian people, all the spiritual people didn't like me either because they were all afraid I was going to ruin them or something. I don't know. And none of them would talk to me either. So I had no friends either from the bad group or the good group. And there was nobody to be my friend. I'd broken up with my girlfriend. My whole world just shambles and I got nobody. Anybody, I, I can tell you how to go from a 2.2 GPA to a 3.6 GPA. You want to know how? Have no friends, have no social life. All you got to do is study. So I went from a 2.2 GPA, almost getting on uh, academic probation to 3.6. How do you do that? Spent all my time studying because I didn't have anywhere to go with anybody to do it with. And then this one dude named Robbie McClure, he was a freak. He had long hair back in the 80s, and he played drums at a, in a rock and roll band. As a matter of fact, the first time we really, really hung out to, with each other, we went, to, uh, we went to a Striper concert at the Old Lady on Brady in Tulsa, and that was back in the day when Striper, Striper was a sin, but uh, we went anyway. Anyway, we were there. Does anybody know who Striper is? All right. All the old people in the room. I'm sorry. You guys have no clue. Hey, they were the rap artists of, no, I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, so anyway, we, I'm hanging out with this dude and he wore these checkered loafers and he had written in pen across the front of it, God on this one rules on this one. And he'd walk up to you and he'd go and make you look down at his feet because it was pointing at you. God rules, you know, he was a weird guy, but he was sold out to Jesus. And you know what? He, he actually became my friend. He accepted me when the spiritual people wouldn't. He accepted me when the ungodly people didn't want to hang out with, any, with me anymore. And he became my best friend. He became the best man at my wedding. We became close friends. What would have happened had Robbie McClure not saw somebody that was hurting and reached out to them? See, our core values, we're talking about our core values as a church. And if you are one of those people that you ever feel isolated, you ever feel alone, you ever feel like you have no friends, I learned a lesson through Robbie, all right? If you want to have friends, I'm going to tell you how to have friends. If you want to have friends, look for the person that has no friends and be their friend. They will be loyal to you for a lifetime. Is this too simple? A lot of us, we want to be the cool kid. We want to be the one that everybody comes to. I want to tell you how to be the cool kid. You ready for this? Find the people that nobody else wants to talk to and be their friend, and they will always be loyal to you. <laughs> As the church of Jesus Christ, we're not called to have people come to us. We're called to go to them. In this house, in this body, in this church, we need to be the Robbie McClure's who are constantly reaching out to the people that are trying to make a transition in their life and feel a little awkward. And if that is you and you feel a little awkward, I want to tell you, you have not only the right place to belong, but I want you to begin invest in other people's lives because when you do that, you will not only find your place of inclusion, you will also find people to be your friends for the rest of your life. All right. I'll tell you one more story. I'm reading a book by a guy named Steve Carter. And he tells a story of when he was a ninth grader. He showed up in high school and he said he was an awkward kid and he didn't really fit in. He didn't know what to do. Well, there were two seniors that were really cool. And one of them's name was Dominic and the other's name was Nathan. And, and they walked up to him because they called themselves Dominic and Nathan. They called themselves Dominate. And they walked up to this ninth grade kid and said, hey, you want to know how to dominate in life? We'll show you. Come to our Bible study. And they took him in and they discipled him in the ways of Christ. And Steve Carter was pre, up until recently, was a pastor on staff preaching to 20,000 people a weekend. What would have happened if a couple of guys wouldn't have saw a little scrawny ninth grade boy and, and took him under their wings? 
The body of Christ is not built by awesome people being awesome, but it's built by normal people being loving. So that is one of our core values. This sermon series is great for you if you're new to Harvest Ridge because we're going to teach you not only who we are but what to expect and how you can participate with us. On my sabbatical, I traveled around to churches and I saw there are lots of churches that do lots of things and I realized that we don't do, need to do more things better. We need to do the things we value better. We are not in downtown Cleveland, so our ministries don't look like a downtown Cleveland church. We are in North Ridgeville, Ohio. We are in this corridor here, and we need to minister like we're in this corridor. And we don't need to do more stuff. We need to do what we're called to do better. So let's talk about what we're called to do. The core of our message is Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. That's the core of our message, the very basic of it all. Acts chapter 4, verse 10 says, It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else. Jesus is the only way to be saved. That is our, that's the very basis and the bedrock of it all. And that is the belief on which we stand, that Jesus is the only way to be saved. There's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So then what do we do with that salvation? We believe our mission statement is that Harvest Ridge Church exists to share the life changing power of Jesus with current and coming generations. We'll handle that last phrase a little bit later in a couple of weeks, but we're here to share the life-changing power of Jesus like we talked about last week with current and coming generations. We do that through four core values. We have four core values. First of all, we want everyone to connect to a resurrected Jesus. We want to have you to have an experience with him that connects you to him forever. We want to build community, which is what we're gonna talk about today. We want you to contribute your time, your talent, and your treasure to build the kingdom of God. And we wanna invest in the next generation by children, by reaching out to and continue to serve children. All right, so today we're talking about community. And we've defined community as providing opportunities for spiritual growth by developing real, honest, and Christ-like relationships. Real, honest, Christ-like relationships. This is not a church where fakers are gonna find yourselves comfortable. This is not a church for fakers or frauds. Do you know why? Because we can't have a real relationship with fakers and frauds, and we wanna have a real relationship with the broken, less than perfect you. It's all right to be broken and less than perfect because then we can have a real relationship with you, a real person, not some image of who you are. Because here's why we don't like image creators. Image creators, guess what? You put up a front and guess what'll happen? Things go wrong, the image falls, and now we've got to deal with the real you. So why not just let us see the real you to begin with? That way we can really like the real you, not some false version of who you are, all right? All right, so that being said, here's our text for the sermon series. I'm sorry, I didn't ask you to turn there, but if you turn your Bibles to Psalm 92, we're gonna be in Psalm 92. I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet in honor of God's word, and we're gonna read Psalm 92 portions of it. Last week, we read the whole thing. Today, we're just gonna read a few portions. Psalm, it's a psalm, a song, so this was meant to be sung, and, and that's why we sing so much in churches, because when you sing stuff, Everybody breathes together at the same time, saying the same words together at the same time. And there's unity that comes when you sing a song. And then the song is for the Sabbath day. So it's good to praise the Lord, to make music to your name, O Most High, proclaiming your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. And then down a few verses, it says, How, how great are your works, Lord, how profound your thoughts. And then our verses, really, this is our, our focus here. The righteous will do what? Come on, what will the righteous do? They will? Flourish. Come on, everybody say this with me. The righteous will flourish. Now, when you say flourish, you can't hold your hands down to your side. You gotta, the righteous will flourish. Yeah, there you go. And that's really what this is. The righteous will flourish. There's, there's something to it, you know? The flourish, you can't flourish like this, right? The righteous will flourish. They're out there. There's, it's, there's something going out from them like a palm tree. Anybody ever see a palm tree? It goes up and then all of a sudden it goes, whoo, right? <laughs> palm trees are made for fun. I, that's the reason Jesus put palm trees on beaches. <laughs> Come on, I'm preaching now. 
<laughs> and it says, they, they grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted, planted. Remember, you've got to be planted if you want to grow. You can't be wandering everywhere. You've got to be planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. They still bear fruit in old age. They stay fresh and green. I, I, I'm getting a new vision. I passed the half a century yard. I'm getting, Mark, I, I'm, I'm getting a new vision for the rest of my life. And the new vision is I'm going to be 75 fresh and green. I'm still going to be high-fiving kids, and I'm still going to be wrestling teenagers when I'm 75. I'm going to play a round of golf less than my age. I'm going to do it. That's a goal. I'm going to flourish. I'm going to stay fresh and green. And you know what? You and I are called not to be dry and to wither up and to be a crusty, old, grumpy person. I did not say old in there. Because you can be a crusty, young, grumpy person, too. We are called to flourish and to stay fresh and green. <laughs> and this is our proclamation. The Lord is upright. He is my rock. There is no wickedness in him. What a great proclamation. Jesus, would you bless our proclamation of you today? And I pray that you would bless these words that I share in the next few minutes. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, but high five somebody first, all right? We're going to flourish a little bit. High five somebody. Tell them hi. All right, so today what I'm called to do is I'm called to present a theology to you of why we believe small groups are the way to truly disciple people. So I'm going to give you a theology lesson today on why discipleship is best accomplished through small groups. So first of all, Jesus called his disciples into a small group to build a relationship. Did he not? Look in Mark chapter 3, verse 14. It says, Mark 3, 14, he appointed 12 that they might do what? They might be with him. So they might go sit in classes. Is that what he called them to? He did not call them to sit in classes and have a bunch of book learning. What did he call them to? To be with him, to be with him, to have a relationship with him, and that he might send them out to preach and have authority to drive demons. Did this work? Did his calling to be with them actually work? Well, I don't know. Acts 4.13 says when they saw the courage, this is later that, that previous one was the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Here's the end after he's gone, taken into heaven. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, and they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. Apparently, hanging out with Jesus changed them in such a way that they changed the world. Now, years ago, we used to have Sunday school. Now, I have no problems with Sunday school for other churches. I'm fine that they have Sunday school in other churches. But years ago, we had two services. We were moving into two services. We were trying to fit Sunday school in, and it didn't work. And, and we just decided then that we would look at the Scripture to see how Jesus discipled people. Did he sit in a room and teach didactically so one person did all the talking and all the others listened, and you regurgitated what you heard, is that how Jesus made disciples? No, Jesus called disciples to himself. He walked around with them, did life with them. They ate a lot. Come on, go through the Bible sometime and pick up how many times Jesus ate. He was constantly at parties and constantly eating. So I think our life groups should look like parties and eat a lot, right? Somebody say amen. That's a, that's a word from God right there. All right, so anyway, what Jesus did was he was with them, did relationship, did life with these people. And as he did life, three and a half years later, these people turned the world upside down. And I started asking myself the question, were we accomplishing turning the world upside down by having people sit in a room, listen to someone, tell them more they should do that they're not going to do anyway? And I realized that wasn't how Jesus did it. Why are we doing it this way? Because here's the deal. You got more information coming from this pulpit on Sunday morning than you will ever put into action. <laughs> you get more from this pulpit on a Sunday. You got more in a podcast and book or wherever it is than you will ever live out. You don't believe me. You don't believe me. All right. How many of you 
No, there's something you should do in your life that God would want you to do this and you're not doing it. How many of you know there's something you shouldn't do in your life and God wants you to not do it and you still do it? And if you didn't raise your hand or either one of those two questions, you either are not paying attention or you're an outright liar. So we don't have a knowledge problem. What we have is a discipleship problem. What we have is that we all have a knowledge of God, but we aren't acting on our knowledge. So Jesus did not call his disciples to sit and learn more. He called his disciples to put into practice what they were already called to learn. So we have defined discipleship as this. One believer wanting to grow in relationship with Jesus joins together with another believer who wants to grow in relationship with Jesus and the two together encourage one another to become more Christ-like. If that is the truth, our sole discipleship strategy at this church is that you be involved in a small group. So I would rather you go to your small group than you to come to a Sunday morning service. Yes, we are not in it to fill butts in seats. We're in it to change people's lives for eternity. And you do that by being in relationship with other believers in your small group. Am I being very clear about what our strategy is? And our strategy is a biblical strategy because Jesus did not, uh, come on, I believe in teaching God's word and we have opportunities for that and we have book studies for that and we got a, this, this alpha is going to teach you things you're going to go, wow, I didn't know that. We have opportunities for that, but what we need you to do is what the Bible says we should do and that is get together with others who are called together to be like Jesus. And I'm pounding this point because I don't think some of you got it yet. Come on, get in a small group now. Second of all, the church is a relationship. What is a church? The church is any gathering of two or more people where Jesus is the Lord. Matthew chapter 18, or Matthew chapter 18, verse 20 says, where two or more are gathered in his name, there he is in their midst. So a, a church is where any two believers are together and they're declaring Jesus as Lord. So there are three levels of the church, or the ecclesia, the called out ones. Ecclesia means literally called out ones. I preached a whole sermon series on this, so I'm not going to go into detail. I'm going to say there are three levels. First of all, there's the universal church. That's all believers. Then there's the local church. There's the believers that unite together under local leadership. And then there's the relational church. That's the church where a group of believers that are built together relationships that bring discipleship. So what does that look like? The universal church includes Baptists in Texas and Anglicans in England and Coptics in Egypt and us in North Ridgeville. That is the universal church of Jesus. All who claim Jesus as Lord are in the universal church, regardless of what fellowship they belong to. Then there is the local church, and that is the local church like Harvest Ridge. Harvest Ridge is a church, one body under the leadership and governance of, I'm using some Greek words here because this is theology today, presbyteros and episkopos. Now, presbyteros literally means elders, and episkopos means bishops. So it's, what they're not under the governance of our pastors, because you see, there's a third level called the Re relational church where those are the ones that are being led by pastors. Let me see if I can explain this. In the church in Philippi, the apostle Paul writes a letter to the church at Philippi with the bishops and the elders and the deacons. And he writes a letter addressing the whole church. And then later on in the book, he addresses two people called Yodi and Syntyche. And Yodi and Syntyche were two ladies who were house church pastors. Now, they pastored small groups of eight to ten people. Well, 50 if you put everybody together. We'll come back to that in a second. But they pastored this small group, and they're the pastors. But over those pastors of Yodi and Syntyche, the letter is written to the bishops telling them how to make these ladies do their job right. Y'all aren't getting this. 
Let me see if I can explain this. I'm not a pastor. In the strictest sense of the word, I'm not a pastor. Do you know who a pastor is? Your life group leader. Your life group leader is literally a pastor because what does a pastor do? A pastor, the, the word comes, it's a, it's a technical term to be one who walks along with a sheep. So if you've ever been in the hospital, anybody in the room, you've ever been in the hospital or been sick and your life group comes around together and sends you food or prays for you or sends you a card. Anybody ever had that happen? Wave at me, wave at me. A few of you. Your life group, your leader led your group to care for you. That's where the pastoring happens. I see y'all aren't getting this. Part of our problem in the church is we think there's a pastor who's got to do all the work. No, your pastor is your small group leader, and they're there doing life with you. I am an Episcopos. What an Episcopos is, is an elder. That's a person that oversees, a bishop that oversees all the pastors that actually do the ministry in this church. Because they are, you guys are the ones that actually do the ministry. I don't actually do ministry. My job is to put you to work. We'll talk about that next week. That's my job. My job is not to do the work. It's your job to do the work. It's my job to put you to work. You don't believe me? Colossae. The church at Colossae. There was a large church at Colossae. There were several thousand probably in the church at Colossae. And there are, Paul writes a letter to Colossae and he also writes a letter that's to be given to the church at Laodicea. And in that letter of Colossae, he addresses one pastor, but even though the, the letter is written to many of the pastors and many of the church. And what he says in, in uh, where's this at? Colossians 4, 15, give my greetings to the brother and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. Notice how many pastors of churches in the New Testament were women. God's got no problem with that. They're all over the place, but here's the deal. There's an, a, there's a structure and a leadership and a governance. That's what we're trying to do here. By the way, do you know once you get a church past 50 people, you can't know everybody in it anymore? A after 50. Anybody that says, the church's too big, I don't know anybody. Well, good, it's about time. We're acting like the Bible church. There's a lot of people, but there's a place you are known. All right, so let me give you the philosophy, all right? Jesus did it. He did it in Luke. Well, he did it in all four Gospels. But in Luke chapter 9, 14, it's very clear. You remember when he fed the 5,000? He said there were 5,000 men there, but he said to his disciples, have them all sit down in groups of about how many? 50 each. Now back in those, do you know that studies have shown you can only actively know and participate regularly with about eight people? You can only be really close friends with about eight people. Any more than that, you, you just don't have the bandwidth for it. I was talking to a guy this past week. He was saying that there's a buddy. He has a friend that has a thousand friends, calls them friends. But there's no way he has a thousand friends because if you had a thousand friends and you had breakfast, lunch, and dinner with every friend in your friend group, it would take you a year to meet with every person once. And that's not a real friendship. Am I correct? You can't have thousands of friends, but you can have a few friends. The problem is, listen to me, people say, that sounds like clicks. Of course it's clicks. I got no problem with clicks. I have a problem with exclusive clicks. Do you know what an exclusive click is, don't you? It's when you're a jerk to anybody not in your click. But as long as you're an inclusive click and you love people who are outside of your click, I got no problem with clicks because you're going to have them no matter what because you only got about eight people you can really know. So Jesus had them sit down in groups of 50. Why did he have them sit down in groups of 50? Because he wanted everybody to eat. And he knew that if he had them sit down in groups of more than that, they wouldn't eat. You know why? Because there was one person in that group that was the leader. And that one leader in the group called their eight friends around. By the time you got their spouses and their kids, there were a group of 50 gathered around. Groups of about 50. <laughs> now it's about 30 in today's culture. We don't have as many kids. So it's about 30. You'll have your life group. If you ever get in a life group, anybody, I know there are people in this room, you've been in a life group that grew over 30 people and the whole dynamic was lost. Am, am I right? Somebody can say, man, if you've been in one of those life groups. Do you know why? 
because you lost your friendship group and you can't relate to everybody anymore and you need to split and you need to divide. You need another leader to raise up to take that group and make it your own. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because these relationships are what will help you when life goes crazy. Let me tell you a story. His name was Matt Carnatz. He was a crusty Marine veteran. And he was, he was crusty. He's, <laughs> he was a Marine. Come on. He would say things like, weakness is pain, or pain is weakness, leaving your body. He was that guy. And anybody remember Matt? Matt was a little crusty. Yeah, a little, hard-nosed. He, uh, he knew I wanted to work out, so he started working out with me. And we met in my basement, and we'd work out. And uh, this was, I'd never had a friend in the church before, a real friend. You know, the kind of friend you can actually talk to about stuff. Because I was told in Bible college, you're not allowed to do that, that that's actually damaging. Oh, what, how they lied to us. Anyway, me and Matt Carnatz, we worked out in my basement for about a year. And I got to trust him. And I learned to love him. And we developed a relationship. And one day I was going through something really bad. And he said, you're not acting like yourself. And I told him what was going on, the way it was going on. I told him the truth. I did. No barriers, no walls, no lies, no makeup. I told him the truth. He said, sit down. <laughs> and when Matt said, sit down, you didn't, he didn't talk back. Come on, I saw him bench press 365 pounds. You don't tell Matt. No. So I sat down on the bench and he laid hands on me and this crusty old Marine prayed over me. And when he prayed, the spirit that was on me was broken and I was free and God did a miracle in my life and I will always be sold out to having real relationships with people I do life and ministry with. It changed my life. I'm inviting you to change your beliefs and your behaviors and to step into the way God has designed for you to have health. What does that look like? It looks like a mess. It does. So let me give you the actions that make it happen. Y'all ready for that? There are one another passages in the Bible, one another. And then there are things that are said around one another passages. And I looked at them and I thought, I'm just going to share my favorite one with you. It's 2 Corinthians 13, 12. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Yeah. That's my wife for my verse, right? My verse for my wife right there. My wife verse, you know, whatever. I'm like, come here, baby. Give me a holy kiss. I don't want a kiss. I want a holy kiss. You guys are dead. <laughs> Come on, you got to have some fun with that. Now, how do we greet one another with a holy kiss? If you've ever been down south of the border, you know they do the whole air kiss thing. Yeah, that's all fine. That's not our culture. But there's a truth there that we're to greet one another like we actually care for each other. All right? But I like the holy kiss. I just had to throw it in. I'm sorry, bro. There ain't no way under God's green earth I'm giving you a holy kiss. <laughs> Ain't having it. Ain't having it. You, you're not my style. Sorry. Thank you for that. <laughs> but my wife now, holy kiss. That sounds like fun. Yeah. All right. So let me give you some other one another's. All right. Romans 12, 10. Be devoted to one another. Honor one another above yourselves. Romans 12, 16. Live in harmony with one another. Romans 15, 7, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you. Uh, 2 Corinthians 13, 11, encourage one another. At least five times in the New Testament, the direct words, encourage one another in that order. Um, Galatians 5, 13, serve one another humbly. I love the adverb there, humbly. You don't just serve one another, you serve one another humbly. That's not, oh yeah, I'll serve you, but I'm better than you. Nope, nope, nope. All right, how about Ephesians 4, 2? Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. There are at least 13 times in the New Testament where we're commanded one another to love. Love one another. Uh, how about um, Ephesians 4? 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ in Christ God forgave you. Ephesians 5 21, submit to one another. Colossians 3 13, bear with one another and forgive one another. Colossians 3 16, teach and admonish one another. 1 Peter 4 9, offer hospitality to one another. All of these verbs, all of these verbs, none of them is a verb that says you get to feel good. I've been married 30 years. 
30 years, the same woman. <laughs> Miracles never cease to happen. She hadn't killed me yet. Divorce has never been an option, but murder, she's considered it a few dozen times. <laughs> that being said, I've learned something in 30 years of having a real relationship. The verbs I just read you about our relationship with one another, I've learned something after 30 years of being married to the same woman. I'm not always right. <laughs> okay, I'm not always right. We live in a culture and a world where we think being a Christian is about always being right. But I just read you the verbs, and all the verbs say that we're to put other people above our own opinions. Did I? That our love and our mercy and our kindness and our compassion, our humility and our hospitality and our encouragement are all to lead in our relationships. What would happen if we had one another relationships like this? I'm going to end real quick. Y'all ready? Our relationships make us spiritually strong. The purpose of this discipleship is that we would be spiritually strong so we can invest in one another. Romans 15, 14 says this. I myself am convinced, brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness. Stop. Many of you sitting in this room are not convinced that you're full of goodness. You're convinced that you're full of something else. Badness, selfishness, pride. I want to tell you something. You're in the house of God today because God loves you. And you're not here because you're a loser. You're here because you want to do God's will and God's work. You are full of goodness. If Jesus Christ is in you, you're full of goodness. Stop believing the lies of the enemy and start believing what Jesus says about you and what God's word says about you. First of all, you're full of goodness. You're filled with knowledge. We already covered that. Didn't we cover that? How many of you know something you ought to do and you're not doing it, right? How many of you know more Bible than you practice already? <laughs> we all do. You're filled with knowledge and you're competent to instruct one another. We're competent. You, you are made competent by the Holy Spirit to interact with God's people in such a way as to share with them how to follow God and to love one another. You're competent, not because you're so competent, but because the Holy Spirit in you is. How do, we, how do we know these things? We know them because Ephesians 5, 18 and 19 says, instead be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another, interacting with one another. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, I know I'm going to conclude with this illustration, all right? Y'all ready? This is, we'll be done after I'm done with this. This is you. Let's say this is you. And this glass is filled with air. Am I correct? This glass filled with air. There's water. Right, right. Glass is filled with air. How do I get the air out of this glass? If you cap it off and you suck all of the air out of it, which is what Christianity tells us to do. You've got sin in your heart. Let's get it out. Suck it out. Don't do. Don't, don't, don't. Anybody ever heard don't, 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 don't your entire life? What happens when you suck all of the air out of this glass and you completely remove all the air? What will happen to it? It will explode inward because it can't handle it. It will go into itself in brokenness. That's the problem I have with Christianity as it's been defined in our culture. All of our don't, 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 don't is all focused on us and it makes us explode in and on ourselves. The Bible does not tell us to take things out of our lives, what it tells us to do is to put something in. The Bible says, be filled with the Spirit. If the Spirit of God comes to live in you, well then guess what? I just got rid of all the air in this glass, didn't I? Be filled with the Spirit means I just got rid of all the air. You were trying to figure out how to get rid of it, I just showed you how to get rid of it. You replace it with something else. 
And the Bible instructs us to be filled with the Spirit. Filled. Now, that word filled is a Greek word, pimple me. I love that word. Pimple me. Be filled means pimple me. That's probably where we got pimple from. I don't know. Should have. A lot of our Greek words go in the English language. But, you know, come on. Anybody ever have a pimple? Anybody ever get one of those big, juicy white ones? You know what I'm talking about? comes right there on the end of your nose, and it's like, it's a beacon calling out for everyone. You walk up to it, and they're like, oh, hi, you know? Anybody ever get one of those pimples? The rest of you are lying. You all went through puberty. Come on, you're old enough in this room. You've had one. I've had them. I had them bad when I was younger. I got a big, juicy one right there. And you know what you do with a big, juicy pimple? Come on, what do you do with it? And you break the window, right? The mirror. If that's gross to you, I don't care. I preach for junior hires. The rest of you get to watch. So you pop the zit and you've seen it. Pimp. When you pimple me, what happens? Boom, it squirts out everywhere. Am I correct? That's what the Holy Spirit does to you. Because a lot of you think the Holy Spirit's going to come on you and all you're going to do is you're going to get something in you. No, you're not. The Holy Spirit's going to come in you and it's going to fill you and it's going to fill you and he's going to fill you. The Holy Spirit's going to fill you and fill you and fill you. And the more the Holy Spirit fills you, what are you going to do? You're going to overflow on all the other people in your life. Because if this is you, these are your wife and kids and neighbors and your life group because you're competent when the Holy Spirit lives in you you're competent and you're filled with knowledge and God wants you to invest what God's put in you and the people around you be filled with the Holy Spirit come on I'm Pentecost all the way from the bottom of my head to the top of my feet actually beyond the top of my feet top of my feet. I don't know what I'm saying. Come on. I got big feet, I guess. I'm six feet, right? Yeah, there you go. I am Pentecost all the way through, and I think we need to be a people who seek the fullness of the Holy Spirit all the time, and let, let the Holy Spirit flow out of your life. And when you do so in these relationships, you're going to run into a day where Matt Carnatz, your Matt Carnatz, meets you in a life group or in a weight room or a bowling, or if we can get a group together, I'm trying to get, get a golf thing upstairs in the attic. I'm trying to get all kinds of, anything I can do to get you together. You know why? If we can get you together, you'll overflow onto each other and the power of the Holy Spirit will not only change you, but change your world. So Father, I pray that today, every person hearing my voice, they would commit to taking the next step in of relationship be a part of a life group this semester, not wait till later. Do it now. To follow Jesus with all their heart, to grow in relationship with the people in their world, and let us spill on each other the goodness and the love of God, we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet, and I'm going to ask, hey, well, don't, don't stand yet. Life group leaders, life group leaders, those that are supposed to come on. You're supposed to be up here. Are they here today, Pastor Matt? Where are you? Where are you guys? Johnny, get up here. Come on. There you go. Here are these life group leaders. We got some life group leaders. Oh, by the way, are you guys starting a life group? You haven't done one before, have you? Just stand right over here. You, you, guys, you haven't done one before? It's a brand new life group? Brand new? So you mean somebody that's brand new to life groups could actually attend yours and not be out, not jump into an old group? You guys got a big one, right? You're one of those, you got 30, you need to split. You need to raise up another leader, but well, we'll get them. Got a, yeah, small groups. Over there, you guys starting one? Yeah, okay. Tell her about your name. My Joe Hetzel. Joe? Joe Hetzel, yeah. Joe Hetzel hung out with me yesterday in my daughter's volleyball game. He's cool. Anybody come to my daughter's volleyball game is cool. I don't care. Joe's starting a new life group, right? Brand new? So people could come to yours. You got a nice house over there in uh, Meadow Lakes. Yeah, yeah. You got a nice place. You can go join him at his life group. Brand new. You guys still do prayer on Wednesdays? Still do prayer Wednesdays what time? 9.30. 9.30? You... 
Liz, you guys still got a life group? You mean people still put up with you? Oh, I love, I love those guys. They're awesome. Well, who's down there? You guys starting one, Paula? You guys took some time out, right? They're so, they're like, they're Jesus and addicts, all right? They took some time out of life groups and now they, like an addict, they got to come back and get back in it again, right? Starting another one? And you guys got a big group over in Brooklyn, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. The Brooklynites are all like, yeah. <laughs> Now, why am I saying this? You need to get in a small group. Here they are. Some of these are brand new. You could come in, you could join. Nobody would know you haven't been in a life group before now. Come on, get in. This is your day. And if you don't get them here, come up and talk to them. They'll talk to you. Catch them in the hallway, talk to them. If you don't want to do that, sign up on the hub right outside. Or if you don't have time, go sign up online when you get home or later on your way home just not while you're driving. Harvestridge.net, okay? I'm letting you out in enough time to talk. So Jesus, this is your body and your church. We wanna be filled with the Spirit. We want to be the people you've called us to be. Let us do so. And I pray that every one of these life groups would fill up with people who are both discipled and walking in faith and just beginning so that together there would be life. In the name of Jesus, we pray it, amen. Man, come see them. God bless you. Have a great day, huh?